We will start with that there. Holcroft Covenant. Drew, what's that about? Uh, just before I go on to that, Scott, can I just ask, had you ever read a Robert Ludlum novel? No. No, no, neither have I. Um, I've had one for a while. The Bourne Supremacy, I think. Hmm. Or maybe the Ultimatum. It came with one of the Bourne films in Virgin Megastore. Right. Um, that, that's dating what it and me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't think I'll ever bother reading them in the future now, but um, <laughs> we'll get on to that. But it, it, I was wondering whether that would explain anything. <laughs> uh, yes. So, Michael Caine plays New York architect Noel Holcroft, uh, and kind of like the swarm, <laughs> where it's like, mm. I've been American for this many years now. Um, <laughs> Brad Crane. Oh, God. <laughs> um <laughs> At least no Holcroft's a believable cartoon for Michael Caine here. Uh, yes, it, it, it great pains to point out that he is uh, a naturalised American citizen. Um, and I don't know why they did it, because they said he, he fleed. The, the, he went from Germany when he was like one or two or something like that. So it in no way explains the fact that he sounds like Michael Caine, as he always does. Yes. <laughs> I'm definitely from New York. I'm going to complain about the traffic so you think it's authentic. Not buying it. (laughs) And completely unnecessary to the plot. Anyway. And also done at least two times, if not three. Mm. Um, (laughs) Yes, anyway. uh, Kane plays New York architect Noel Holcroft, a simpleton in this film written by simpletons for simpletons. After an entirely unnecessary opening in the last days of the Second World War in Germany, in which we see three Nazi officers talk about a pact they are making for the benefit of their sons, before all being shot by one of the group, Holcroft is contacted by Michael Lonsdale's Swiss banker, Ernst Manfredi, who asks him to come to Geneva. Lonsdale's character, I feel I should point out, works for La Grande Banque de Genève. Now, things do work differently in other languages. For example, Grand Prix may sound somewhat exotic in English, but does of course mean simply big prize in French. But in this case, I think the Big Bank of Geneva is a pretty good indicator as to quality of writing on display here. Manfredi arranges to meet Holcroft on a ferry to deliver his important news, instead of inside the private, quiet and above all secure environs of a bank. You will understand once I tell you this information why we are not having this meeting at the bank, Manfredi tells Holcroft. Now, call me a cynic if you must, but is it because it's much harder to have people attempt to assassinate Holcroft immediately after your meeting if it's not if it's in a bank? <laughs> anyway, immediately after their meeting, some people attempt to assassinate Holcroft. This is foiled by another assassin, this one currently not minded to assassinate Holcroft, though Holcroft himself is oblivious to this because... As I've already stated, Holcroft is a simpleton. (laughs) The reason for the meeting, and the assassination attempt, is that Holcroft's father was one of the Nazi officers seen in the opening scene, who apparently had a change of heart and channelled millions of Reichsmarks out of the Wehrmacht into a Swiss bank, so that reparations could be made to the Third Reich's victims. This money, now in the amount of $4.5 billion, is said to be spent at Holcroft's direction, with the aid of the sons of the other two officers. Why this took the seemingly arbitrary time of 40 years to come into effect is not explained. But suddenly there's a ticking clock on the whole thing. With some people determined Holcroft should sign the legal document to take control of the fund, and some determined that he must not. Though some of these seem to forget this later in the film. It also seems that this super secret bank account is in fact known to pretty much everyone in the world, with the exception of Holcroft. So the film grinds along with the entirely shocking revelation that the fanatical Nazis hadn't in fact had a change of heart, but wanted to create a new generation of fanatical Nazis, and that this money will enable this, by means of a ridiculous plan spelled out to the world's media by a Holcroft who has, presumably, had his plot spelled out to him. (laughs) Equally shocking is that almost all of the other people involved are exactly what they seem, i.e. Nazis. Even... Gasp! The woman, who for some reason is called Helden, the German for heroes, maybe this is a name in other languages, but she's German, so heroes it is, and well, only at two points was I wrong about any revelation at all, and that's because I guessed Michael Lonsdale was in on it, and I thought it might turn out that the field marshal that we see earlier in the film was actually Noel's father, who we didn't actually see die, and well, neither would have been out of place here. You know what, Scott, actually, I tell a lie. It was three times I was wrong, 
because I didn't predict the incest subplot. Because <laughs> why the hell would I? It's not actually written by a German after all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, for any German listeners that we might have, I, I hope you realise that's just a, um, a running joke and not an actual condemnation of Germans. <laughs> um, it is garbage, though, as opposed to the Osterman weekend. It's at least coherent garbage, hmm. though that's cold comfort indeed. How much of that is the fault of screenwriters Edward Anholt, George Axel, or John Hopkins, or of director John Frankenheimer, I can't say. Though to be even-handed in my criticism, I suspect quite a bit. But my suspicion is that the greatest fault lies in the source novel. But, as uh, mentioned at the beginning here, having not read it, I am not in a position to confirm or disconfirm that suspicion. Certainly my notes, of which I made many while watching this, consists of lots of whys and a considerable number of... Oh, I'm going to have to change my notes here, Scott. Uh, to, to keep it clean, let, let's use the more um, accepted Irish version, fake offs. <laughs> oh, and not one single note I made was positive. I offer a select few now, in no particular order, as warning to you and catharsis to me. And I readily accept that this review isn't well written, but my excuse is that it apparently doesn't need to be as you can get a major motion picture made, directed by the director of possibly the best political thriller ever, even if you're writing the level of Dick and Jane. Let's begin with, why isn't Noel more belligerent or questioning? It's hard to know how we might act or react in many situations, but in many of the situations here, I know damn well I wouldn't be taking this so meekly. On being expected to get on a horse. You do ride, don't you? You can piss off, can't you? An old man points a gun at Noel, who has done nothing wrong and is in this against his will. He wrests the gun from him, then doesn't do anything. I wouldn't use the gun, but you best be believing that if I'd had that gun pointed at me, the fecker who did it would now have a mouthful of teeth, wheelchair and age notwithstanding. Hang from MI5. Well then, he must be. Why would he say it otherwise? Piss off. Show me some ID. It may turn out to be counterfeit, but at least I've made a cursory attempt at confirmation. Then there's an I love you from old Heroes McGee after knowing Noel for about two days. Seems cromulent. Oh, and feck off, do. Don't fly. The airport's not safe. Drive, that's better. But I'll take the train. Okay. Not a single question comes from Noel. So this has just become stream of conscious now, but well, I've written it and I'm going to read it, damn it. Noel eventually tumbles to the fact that Heroes is also a rotter because she mentions a piece of information she could have only had got from another conspirator. I didn't mention the dog. Really? Really? That? That ridiculous cliché? Now, to be fair, sometimes that works. But in a film where it has been made abundantly clear that the character has been drilled for her entire life to be careful, use code words, to prepare weapons, to always be alert, to lie endlessly and convincingly, and that's how she tips herself up. Kindly remove yourself from this place and make love to yourself in a vigorous fashion. What's particularly irritating about this is that she actually was betrayed earlier, when it's pointed out to know that his pistol, given to him and assembled by Heldon, won't actually function as the return spring is incorrectly fitted. This would have been quite a good way to do it, but no, Noel is a one-watt bulb at the best of times. In the final scene, Noel hands a working pistol to Heldon, and then turns his back on her and waits for her to kill herself. Lucky he'd read the script, I guess, because what if she hadn't done that, Noel, you dim-witted pillock? Field Marshal, no wonder I was in love with you when I was a child. You always were mad about uniforms. You're the same damn age. Actually, the woman's older. What are you doing, Film? The main villain, Johan, is the son of a Nazi who has been on the run his whole life and used to live in us in, and used to live in South America. Wake the feck up, Mikey boy. And finally, you will no doubt be exceedingly pleased to hear. Uh, finally, a scene from near the beginning in which a bewildered Noel gets into a car in which they barely more than a stranger at this point held in his waiting for him, sitting for some reason in the passenger seat. Noel informs that he can't drive. To which she responds, Do you realise you're endangering our lives because of your incompetence? Get it up, ye. Sideways. Uh, And this last, I extend to all involved with this piece of trash. So yeah, 
Didn't like this, Scott. I loved it. I thought it was the best film that I've seen for this podcast. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not really saying an awful lot. Um, no, I, I, I certainly don't really disagree with anything that you're saying there. It, it, it didn't bother me as much because the Osterman weekend had already pissed on the chips. And um, <laughs> this, as you say, at least at least holds together as a narrative in, in the, the kind of wider viewed from space kind of sense. Although, again, you never trust Hugo Drax when he comes to you with any kind of scheme. It's not, not going to work out well for anyone. Yes, it's just, just just not very good. Uh, I wasn't really thinking about it very much. It was not uh, almost trying not to pay attention to it. So it kind of washes over me as a kind of just generic go here, do this, do that, do these kind of things. And Michael Caine has enough charisma to kind of get away with some of that. Um, oh, it he's does a get a bit... worthwhile thing, isn't it, Scott? Yeah, um, that's kind of a running theme between these two is it's actually got, there's a lot of talent involved in it and it's just completely wasted in this one. You know, Frank Neimer, of course, is the director and you know, Kane, so you're normally dependable and, you know, both fine. I don't think I've actually got all that much complaints about the direction as such. It's just the material's subpar. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't stand up to any scrutiny at all. Uh, I could kind of get behind it with, you know, Kane's character just being, you know, Holcroft being, you know, confused and just swept along with things and kind of going with it for a while but that goes on for like 85 minutes and then for for one brief shining minute he knows everything somehow suddenly yeah. for no, no explained reason he despite said, having explained everything else in sort of in minute detail that you really didn't need to um this one he's oh by the way i found this 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 is going to this this is going to happen this is going to happen and then he's back to being a dummy again it's <laughs> It's very convenient for the plot that that happened, but uh, yeah, it's not particularly convincing as a film. <laughs> yeah, he's got no agency. He's just like yeah. bounced around in it, and but he's apparently got no willpower. You set him up as as an architect, I mean, and people in all professions can be stupid in other ways too. But you know, an architect who suggested he's got to deal with like really difficult employers and stuff, and building contractors and things, and then but then he's just like, oh no, um, I'm going to act like a little boy through the rest of the film. Mm. Yes, just because it's convenient. Um, and as I say, you could have got away with that for a little while, just out of general shock and just going along with it. But yeah, he, he, he just does not establish much of a character for himself at all, which is a shame because it's Michael Caine, you know. Um, you could you could normally get some interesting things out of him, but yeah, not, not really this interested. It, it didn't offend me uh, the same way it did you, but certainly I would never recommend anyone watch it. It's not particularly uh, good um, for this kind of thing. I mean, I suppose you can kind of see a bit of the kind of kind of similarity between it and what the Bourne films did, but the Bourne films did it much, much, much better. Um, plainly, whether they've either worked off a better book of Ludlums or uh, have edited it down to the bits that actually worked. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's, it's the same sort of, you know, go, go here, uncover this thing, go there, go uncover that thing, go here, uncover that thing, and globe trotting and all that kind of stuff with chase scenes and all this. The, the general structure is the same, but the quality is so much different. Um, yeah. Uh, sadly, not not one that is uh, worth ex- excavating from the archives. Yeah, I did. Um, the the Born Identity and the Born Films in particular were in my head, and it did make me wonder, um, given that both of these are such stinking tollies of films um <laughs> whether like you know it was a case of like the, the the source novel is not good but like somebody's found a, a good idea and then expanded on mm. that a lot of these books were bestsellers but that doesn't really mean anything because so was the da vinci code so yeah yeah it's it concerns me that these books um are the, the it does concern me but i think maybe the the born identity was a bit of luck. Yes, <laughs> um, I mean because there's sort of vaguely interesting ideas in here. That there's like, I mean, other, but other films have um, done sort of similar stuff there, but kind of like kind of some of the ideas have like resonance in other films, like the boys from Brazil. And what this actually made me remind uh, reminded me a lot of was um, the Odessa file. Yeah, yeah. I bet that's considerably better than this. Yes. <laughs> considerably better. Yeah, well, honestly, just, this was a miserable watch, but again, it, it was coherently miserable. Yes. <laughs> honestly, I'm not sure if that's better or worse. Um, I didn't enjoy it more than the other film, but I disenjoyed it less. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, honestly, there was only 
one point in the entire film where I had any sort of entertainment at all, and it was entirely unrelated to the film, but I, I'm going to mention it here just because it amused me. Um, I, you know, Scott and I all often, and as I say, uh, you know, as I say, no, I, I have done it for quite a few years now, but very often have Spanish subtitles when I enter them watching, just kind of... Mm. Um, I was always the idea was to brush up with Spanish and stuff and help my translation and then as I got better at Spanish I, I was quite amused at like like interested in the kind of like if you've got like idioms and stuff how you translate them to another language you just do it directly or is it like a figure of speech and stuff mm-hmm. and then I'm getting better like so you can tell whether someone has done it by ear generally where like you work at what they probably misheard something as or whether it was done from a script Mm. In this case, this was clearly done by ear, but I'm, again, I was going to be because it amused me so much, and I, I couldn't work out what it could possibly um, have been misheard as. In the the scene where he has to convince the field marshal that he's um, that he's not a Nazi, which he does um, by saying, "I'm not a Nazi." <laughs> okay, then Michael Caine delivers the line. Neither am I going to f- uh, finance a redesigned Edsel. Okay, right? Mm. Which was translated to Spanish as neither am I going to finance any porno film. <laughs> um, <laughs> and unlike anything else in the film, that provided me a good couple of minutes of entertainment trying to work out what the <laughs> hell that was meant to have been misheard as. <laughs> yes. I have no point there. Um, but just, you know, I, I just I hated this. That's why I went and that kind of screwed up all the stuff that bothered me because I wanted to get it out. <laughs> And the, I think the most frustrating thing is, this is from the director of the Manchurian Candidate. Yeah, this is one of them, so I was referring to when I said possibly the best mm-hmm. political thriller ever made. Uh, certainly one of it. Whether well, you can any pick any particular one that's the best of anything, but and then I mean it's not even like it was the the end of his career and you know he'd kind of lost the touch on it because this is like a decade before he made Ronan, which is excellent. Yeah. As we discussed Mm -hmm. quite recently. Uh, So there's quite a lot of talent potentially going on here, but it's just completely uh, squandered. And Michael Lonsdale squanders, he almost always is. Yeah, yeah. So as I kind of mentioned, for both of these films, there's quite a lot of talent on paper. On paper, these seems like they would be quite good ideas, but uh, yeah, the the, the sad reality of it is there's not one. It's not yeah. unfolded as I expected. <laughs> unfortunately, the, the, the paper that's on does appear to have been toilet paper. Um, yes. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> right. Um, 